Hi, everybody. I'm Kim Skates with Central Houston. I am so excited to introduce you today to Greg Lindsay. Greg is an urbanist, a futurist, a journalist. He is an urban tech fellow at Cornell Tech's Jacobs Institute, a senior fellow at MIT's Future Urban Collective Lab. He's a former contributor to Fast Company and Fortune. He's been cited as an expert on CNN, NPR, Washington Post, USA Today, He's either been quoted in it or written for it. Uh, his area of expertise is the future of cities. He also speaks on mobility and innovation and globalization. So who better to deliver a keynote address at Central Houston's big annual event, the state and future of downtown on November 4th. Greg, it's so good to be with you. Thanks for having me, Kim. And I am thrilled to join you in person in November as well. So glad we can get started early. Good. So you were in Houston this past spring. Uh, what'd you think of our downtown? I really enjoyed it. I mean, coming coming from Manhattan, I'm used to like the, the mega-ness of Manhattan there. But Central Houston, I mean, so many great qualities, particularly what I was most surprised by was just the history and the variety, particularly off sort of Main Street there and seeing, of course, you know, the music venues that have been added. I went to a show at the 713 Music Hall, uh, had a chance to walk through and spend time in the parks there. And I just think, I mean, I think Central Houston has so much character to offer. And I think to the point of what we'll talk about in November, though, is, you know, how do you take those natural advantages and maximize them? And how do we create new partnerships to create new kinds of public assets that can benefit everyone and not just people in the skyscrapers? And I think that's the central challenge facing Houston and I think cities all across the United States, if not the globe. Yeah, absolutely. So I know you've been doing a lot of traveling this year, but what else have you been working on? Uh, I've got a whole number of projects starting. So I, as you mentioned, I'm going to Cornell Tech this fall for a one-year fellowship uh, on my project called the Metaverse Metropolis. Uh, as viewers are no doubt aware, the metaverse is coming. I think most people think of virtual reality, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and all that. But less heralded is augmented reality, which is the idea of wearing glasses or other some form of headset which project information on the environment. Apple supposedly building a, a set of glasses to be the successor to the iPhone. And I'm most interested in helping cities think about how do we create the stop sign of the metaverse? How do we ensure public safety in a world where people are literally roaming around in other realities? It's taken us 10 years to get to the point where we're walking around with our cell phones glued to our faces. What happens when people are literally seeing something else in front of them? And so I'm putting together a whole task force there to think about how do we create the kind of futures we want? Because if we do it right, it could be incredibly advantageous for cities. Uh, I'm also starting a project. Uh, I'm the chief uh, communications officer at Climate Alpha, which is a new startup by my friend Parag Khanna, which is advising investors and governments on thinking through areas of opportunity in a world of climate change. So rather than telling you how at risk you are, we want to say, here's where you should go and here's where you should build and here are the great places of tomorrow. So we're developing that tool as well and, and, and talking to a lot of people about, you know, how do we kind of build the cities we need? So that's just a taste. I've got all sorts of other projects I'm trying to pair back. I know you do. Yeah. So speaking of cities, a couple of years ago, we were hearing a lot about the death of the city. Uh, how's that playing out? <laughs> I'm, what, what is the Twain quote? Reports of cities' demise were greatly exaggerated. I, I'm, I am very happy to see um, that, yes, that you know, just about every prediction made about the death of cities turned out to be wrong. I mean, obviously, we saw huge changes across the United States. You know, there were large outflows of people from very expensive, high-cost coastal metros to places like Houston, and of course, across Texas and the entire Sun Belt. Um, so that definitely happened. And we've seen, of course, that you know the, the d death of the office was overly exaggerated as well, Houston being at the forefront of that, of people back in offices. Not to the level they were, we should discuss that. But still, like when I was there in May in Houston, there was a level of vibrancy and, and daily life on the street that you'd be hard pressed to find in places like San Francisco and elsewhere. So, so it's sort of uneven, right? We can sort of see that the return to cities is playing out depending on the state and the culture and sort of what's happening there. But, but yeah, the, what people want in cities is not to go sit in an air conditioned cubicle. It's they want that vibrancy. They want to be with other people. And, um, and yeah, we've seen this huge resurgence in restaurant bookings and bars and all the convivial things in life that people I've always wanted from cities. So we were um, we were just talking about Tokyo, and I know you bring a, a global perspective to research around cities. How is that across the world? Is that different than what we're experiencing here in the U.S.? Yeah, again, the most unevenness is totally globally. So I was in London at the end of February. That was my most recent international travel, and I was there the day they dropped all restrictions. So it was incredible, particularly to visit the train stations. Like London has a back in the office, back in the city culture that far outstrips anything I've seen in the United States. So seeing, you know, Victoria Station and others packed the rafters with people was really something to behold. 
Um, Asia, of course, is a totally different thing. You know, I, I see reports now from Seoul where there's still a very, uh, very not strict culture, but very socially enforced culture of masking and testing all that. But, so, but that allowed life to go on as per normal throughout much of the pandemic for them with low infection rates. So I think there's a lot to learn actually from Tokyo and Seoul for other cities about, you know, how do you manage the risks of the ongoing pandemic with like vibrant urban life? Um, so yeah, but I can't wait to see. And then finally in that category are the European cities like Milan and Madrid and others and Paris, of course, that really took an opportunity to rethink what downtown life should be. Um, the so-called 15-minute city concept of, of living a life closer to home, but one that's full of vibrant urban spaces. There are a lot of ideas lying on the ground now of how to rethink what the cores of our cities can be. And it's really exciting to see all these experiments that are being taken to the next level across the globe. I love that question now of what has become possible. How can we rethink opportunity? Absolutely. So one of the big um, push pulls that we're all seeing in the business world is this return to the office versus fully remote versus hybrid. Uh, it feels really unsettled to me right now, like what it looks like today is probably not what it's gonna look like in five years, but there are some emerging trends. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of unspoken assumptions and elephants in the room when it comes to return to office. You know, no one wants to really talk about these issues, which are really about agency and power and 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 you know effectiveness versus just control. So, for example, I mean, you know, the workers who really want to have remote and particularly hybrid work for people who are always living part of their life in the office, right? Before the pandemic, we would do daily tasks there because it was so central to our everyday life. So now they've just tried to separate that out and have that from work from home. They like that agency, they want that. Uh, organizations, I think, understand that they function as a whole better face-to-face -face and having you know, uh, you know, high communication bandwidth between people, the possibilities for serendipity, better information flow. But they often use that as a mask for, I think, more underlying issues about managers are scared they can't control people or manage up if they're not there in person. So I think there's a lot of work to be done about organizations realizing that they need to let go of that and that they need to offer reasons for people to come in and they need to keep the good and get rid of the bad of those toxic work cultures. And so it'll be interesting to see if most organizations make that leap. Because I think the next task, and this is where it comes back to Central Houston is, is you know, we've proven that you can work from a dedicated space five days a week, eight hours a day. We've also proven that you can work from home for as little or as long as you like and still get your goals done and that can happen. I think the next phase is realizing that it might be good for us to have dedicated places to work, but not always next to people who receive a paycheck from the same organization. What if you can work in a different series of spaces with people who are your peers, depending on your style of work, depending on what you wanna learn. And it'd be really interesting to create these kinds of new public, private, work, live, play spaces in the center of cities where people can get together and do that. Adam Newman got ridiculed for doing that with WeWork and mistakes were made there, let's just say the least, but co-working as a trend was really powerful before that. And I think we could really turbocharge that if organizations get behind the idea of we need to offer all sorts of options to workers where they can go and do their best work, not just either require they come to an office or let them basically work from home forever. And I, I hope we're in a ripe era of experimentation for that as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so we look forward to hearing more from you when you come on November the 4th. As you know, you will be sharing the stage with U of H's head basketball coach, uh, Kelvin Sampson, who led the Cougars to the Final Four last year, is coming into this season as a top-ranked team. So we're super excited to have him. And then you're going to give us a global perspective on cities and future of urban environments. And then for the first time ever, we're going to have a state of downtown address delivered by our president and CEO, Chris Larson. So we're really excited about the program. It's going to be great. In the meantime, if people want to follow you, learn more about you, what's the best way for them to do that? You can find me on all the usual platforms. I'm on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm also at, at uh, www.greglindsay.org where I keep updated on my whereabouts and various projects. So I would encourage anyone who's watching, particularly anybody who's interested in the state of the metaverse and what it means for cities and its possibilities to please drop me a line. I'd love to talk. Wonderful. To you. Good. Well, we look forward to having you in November. And thanks to all of you who are joining us today. If you want more information about our state and future of downtown event on November 4th. You can find it at centralhouston.org. There's a tab at the top that says annual meeting and it will give you everything you need to know. Thank you, bye.